This is words aptly spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25, 11. The word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. So, welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney, Timothy Knotts, and I discuss books from the Classical Conversations Curated Curriculum. Today's Wednesday, May 8th, 2024, and I'm Lee Bortons. Today, Jennifer is away in other meetings, but we're joined by Stephanie Meter, one of our favorites from Classical Conversations Multimedia Curriculum Development. Tim, tell us about this month's shows. So we have a, a little bit of a shorter month this month because we were all off for the national conference last week. Um, but this week, this month, we're exploring our Challenge B curriculum. And today we'll be with Nathaniel Hawthorne's Tango with Tales. Uh, next week, we have a special guest that Lee may reveal more about or not. I don't know. She might hold it a little tight to the vest. We'll see. Um, and then we'll pick up again uh, after that with The Hiding Place by Corey Tenboom and wrap up with The American Experience, which is one of our very own CCMM products. Yeah, th thank you, Tim, for handling this whenever Jennifer's not around. Um, everybody, you can access all of these podcasts, past ones on uh, Lee Bor It's at Lee Bortons on my YouTube channel or LeeBortons.com, my website, where we have archived both the 2023 episodes as well as the 2024 episodes and on um, the calendar there and then the um, uh, links to the CC or classical conversations books.com website so you can purchase the books. And before we moved on, Tim, I wanted to ask you a question that's relevant for words aptly spoken. Um, I just really appreciate you coming on faithfully with Jennifer and I. We've just spent, you know, years with these books. And of course, Stephanie grew up in challenge with most of them. Um, you are newer to us, you've been around quite a while, but has uh, being on the show like been a good review for the books for you? Are you like, would you recommend it to people? What's it done to help you? Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, this is, yeah, this has been really great because there are a few gaps in things that I've either not read or just skimmed of some of the things that my kids have not read yet or have have read apart from me. So it's been great for me to be able to go back and review some of the things. And, and it's, all, they're just great literature. So it's, it's a wonderful experience to get to dig in and be reminded of the the goodness that can be mined, even from short sections of some yeah. of those great works. That's great. Yeah, people ask me all the time about, you know, curating the books. And uh, so a few of them have um, been uh, added to the CC collection since my own children were done homeschooling. So this is one of those in particular that I have not read all of. I've read parts of it. And so I'm really enjoying this because it's making me go back and read the things that I missed. And so, you know, it's never too late to read a challenge book. What about you, Stephanie? What have you been getting out of this, uh, these conversations? I love talking about books. So while it's a good refresher anyway, um, some of these things I haven't visited in a long time, especially those challenge A books. Um, but getting to revisit things as an adult with with other people and talk about them mm -hmm. is one of my favorite things. So the challenge A books, I had not read reread most of them until this and, and getting to review them again and dig dig into them as an adult is really different. And I I enjoy getting different things out of the books and relating to different characters and having a different perspective, you know, things that annoyed me as a child, I, I are, I'm not annoyed by, or I see it differently as an adult. And then getting to unpack with you all is a lot of fun for me. And I think it helps me to remember just how powerful literature is, which is something that I don't really think I ever forget, but it just in, continues to deepen that appreciation for me about the power of a story and the power of conversation. Yeah, that's great. Cause you know, not everybody thinks, oh, I want to be in a book club. And so I thought it would be nice to explain what we're getting out of it. So if somebody stumbles on this, then normally wouldn't keep listening. Maybe they will. Well, thanks for humoring me there. I think Julie actually said she'd like to drop in a comment too here. Sure. Go ahead, Julie. Well, I'm just, I can't keep my mouth shut because Lee just spoke at the CC commencement ceremony and mm. this beautiful speech that she made to the graduates was a weaving together of all most, I mean, I think you covered most of the books um, and 
how they can take each each piece of literature and how it can serve them in in what's to come. And I can start tearing up. It it made me cry when I was listening. And it's such a beautiful picture. Um, So I don't know, Lee, if you'll ever share that speech or send it to me and I'll make a blog out of it. But it was it was just magical to see how well our children will be equipped um, for their adult life as they follow Christ in all of the literature. So it was fantastic, Lee. Well, thank you, Julie. And, you know, it was easy to do because great people wrote these great books and all I did was stumble on them and get some advice from you guys. So I appreciate those kind words. All right. Well, let's let's dig into this one, uh, Lee. We, Jennifer always asks the, the same first question. And just because she's not here doesn't mean we get to shirk our duty. So uh, why Tangle with Tales here in Challenge B? Yes. Yeah, so um, like I said before, this is a book that came on um, more recently than a lot of the ones that have been around since 1997. And uh, I want to read what C.S. Lewis says. We have him quoted in our classicalconversationsbooks.com website about the book. Um, He says, since it's likely that children will meet cruel enemies, let them at least have heard of brave knights and heroic courage. Otherwise, you are making their destiny not brighter, but darker. And this collection of Nathaniel Hawthorne's myths, um, there's six of them, are just, they're almost like Charles and Mary Lamb's introduction to Shakespeare. They're told, uh, like, so children will understand them. In fact, while I was reading through them um, this week, I could hear Pilgrim's Progress, the young children's version in my head. I could hear The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I could hear Charles and Mary Lamb. And so it's just one more book in that coming-of-age collection. And this one's not particularly about coming-of-age. There's some of that in there. But in general, it's just a really good introduction to the ancient mythology that those other authors I just mentioned love so much. And in similar voices. And so it made me realize there really is a tone of voice for children's literature where it's just encouraging and something bad might be happening, but it's not scary. And so once again, we're just introduced to um, a lot of adult ideas in a way that actually there's a lot of adult humor interwoven in here. And I don't even mean Disney adult humor. I mean, adult humor, like, you know, this King invented the ABCs and we really should appreciate him more like things like that, that we would get, but the children won't. So it's just a delightful collection. And who knew Nathaniel Hawthorne could be so fun after, you know, knowing him for other reasons. So those are some of the reasons there that it's part of our collection. It's a good integration. Yeah. Thanks. I think hopefully that's an encouragement. I'm many of us who did grow up with myths did grow up with some kind of a children's version. There are lovely adult versions and our challenge for students read some of those when they get around to reading Ovid um, and the theogony, but um, that's a Lee, what you're we're just commenting on is a great segue. Uh, Stephanie, probably most of our audience, if they know Nathaniel Hawthorne, they know him for the Scarlet Letter or maybe the House of Seven Gables, whichever if you're ever up my neck of the woods, you can actually go visit the House of Seven Gables in Salem, um, which is pretty neat. Um, but those works are definitely a very different kind of work than the Tanglewood Tales. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this collection and something about Hawthorne and how they fit together? Sure. I didn't know that Hawthorne had written this collection until we brought it into the CC universe. So I was surprised because a lot of Hawthorne's stories are adult or heavier. A lot of them center around um, the the dangers of rigid religion or harsh ex- execution without, without mercy and grace. Um, and that may have come from Hawthorne's ancestors were a part of the Salem witch trials. Um, and one of his ancestors, William Hawthorne, um, was, was kind of an overzealous advocate of pure unaffected religion and worship and was a little bit harsh. Um, and as the Hawthorne family started to lose some of their wealth, actually over the generations, Nathaniel Hawthorne wondered if that was just sort of the, the way of things deteriorating because of that harsh interpretation of religion. And I don't know, he really wrestled with that as a person personally. And then that shown through that showed through in his writing. Um, so a lot of his books, the Scarlet Letter in particular are about that, 
um, that balance of grace and rigid religion and what do we do with these thoughts, um, forgiveness, just big themes. And a lot of them do center around religion. Um, so it might be interesting to think of him then as a an author of myths or not an author of of ancient myths for children, um, since he was really rooted in his Christian faith, um, and in getting to work on this book a little bit and then reading it with my Challenge B students, it is fun to see the Christian themes woven through even ancient myths, um, and I think that's one of the hallmarks of you know, the truth of Christianity, that if it is true, it'll be true in, in multiple different forms. We can see those truths, even like God can shine through even some of the, the stories that we don't think of as being strictly Christian. So um, Hawthorne was good at that. He recognized that and brought it, um, brought the ancient myths to us and to children. Um, and it is a fun collection, even if you're not a huge Hawthorne fan. Um, I was not a huge Hawthorne fan, um, but I really like this and I've grown to to like him more just in general. You know, I think at one point we had almost as much Hawthorne in our curriculum as we did Lewis, and I didn't realize it because he's sneaky. He's, he's written in so many different genres. So we used to read in short story, but I think we might have changed it, the story of the Celestial Railroad. No, it's still in there. Still it's in still there. in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now and now we have this book, and then we have the Scarlet Letter. I mean, he really was a a foundational American author. Yeah. Yeah. So... So you sort of hinted a little bit at this, Stephanie. Um, some of some of the aspects of my next question, um, but today when we think about the study of history, um, we have this idea that what we're doing is gathering sort of just factual information about the past. You know, someone did something at some time and place, um, and especially in the last. 10 or 20 years, we, we we haven't had a lot of time culturally for myths and legends. They, they tend to get discarded, right? We throw them away because they're not factually accurate. Um, well, it's an interesting dichotomy because we still are fine with reading fairy tales and things like that to our little kids, you know, but, but as soon as they start to exit that young childhood phase, the, the inclination is to move away from that and into real, real stories. Um, so what is it about reading these kinds of stories, even through those Challenge B years or, or perhaps even into your adulthood that makes them valuable, even if they're not factually accurate? Well, I've wondered, though, about your premise. Um, in reading, you're absolutely right. But, uh, you know, a lot of the movies that are popular now are mythologies, but they're um, based on these ancients. And they're told in a modern way with modern ideas and values intertwined. And we live in this world. There's nothing wrong necessarily with modern stories and old stories being retold from modern times. But there's just this refreshing, that's all I can think of is the word refreshing to read um, the, the horrible stories in some ways. Uh, some of these, one of these stories is about a single mother. You know, there's about... Uh, kings killing people there's bad things in it uh, or bad things happen in the books but they're just told in a way that honors children and honors even our adult souls that i don't think always happens in a modern re redo of a movie yeah i one of the conversations that we had in challenge b it was actually about the phantom toll booth mm -hmm. um but the, the students were debating if the Phantom Tollbooth story was real or if it was a dream. And so I just like threw out to them, I was like, well, what does it mean for something to be real? And then they all just fell silent. And so then we started talking about it. And one of the students said, well, maybe something doesn't have to be real for it to be true. And that opened up such a cool window. And I mean, that was something I guess I was kind of wrestling with in the back of my mind, but this student pulled it to the front and I have not been able to stop thinking about it for years and years. And I think these stories are a reflection of that. Maybe they didn't happen factually, but that doesn't mean they're not true depending on how we, how we interpret that and like that can be slippery obviously but um the values in it are true and the the value of courage is true um there's there's just some statements about what it means to use power well and even though these people maybe didn't live that's a true good use of power um and so just thinking looking at these ancient stories and knowing that 
they can be true even if they're made up. Yeah, I think there's something really powerful about about the archetypes that live in these kinds of stories, right? That we have, we know that there are big bad wolves and sometimes they look like people, right? Um, and and they come in different shapes and sizes. And so you can't, you sort of can't trust your eyes. You have to have that look at that sort of like, you know them when you feel them kind of sense about them that I think like the fables and the myths and fairy tales really help us to see like evil stepmothers and most stepmothers are not evil. They're loving, caring, wonderful women who really earnestly love their, their adoptive children. But, but there's something unnatural about a wrong kind of love for your children or love for a husband that doesn't include the children that that we need to be aware of and and like sometimes we need to be brought out in front of us and looked at because it's not so easy in real life where people aren't archetypes they're they're always a mixture of things something i also like about fairy tales and um, myths is there's definitely nuance and there's depth, uh, particularly if you are well read and know the same literature the author wrote but there's also a black and whiteness to them. In other words, while you're reading it, your child is knowing, no, don't do that. You know, that that's the bad thing or the bad person or um, or that this is the person I can count on. If there's going to be trickery, you kind of told up front that this is a tricky character. So and that was just really important to me because this morning I listened to a podcast. I won't say who it was. It's somebody who's super popular right now. And for about the first 20 minutes, I was like, this is amazing. This guy agrees with everything I've ever thought of in my whole life. And then the last 10 minutes, he totally, he was tricking me. He totally had the wrong conclusion and response to what he was saying. And I was just like, man, and he's so good looking too. He right? <laughs> <laughs> like an evil stepmother or something. So mm. it, it's a real thing and you've got to watch for it. Yeah, that's great, Lee. Um, yeah, I think there's something like, the, like, you know, in one of these myths or, or stories where children in the story get told by their loving parents not to do something. And then in the story, they go and they're tempted to do that thing. And it should trigger in our children and in ourselves that exact like, no, don't do it. You know it's not going to go well <laughs> kind of a response. And then, so there's that sort of, it's a training of the sort of the moral conscience by showing examples that are easier for, for us to see than it is when we encounter those, because we get all messed up by circumstances and relationships. And we're not so sure that our parents are as wise as they think they are, but in this story they are, and it's really abundantly clear. And so it helps us to set some patterns. You know, it also sets you back to the garden where Satan said to Eve, did God really say that? And you know, some sort of trick is coming. Mm. Right? And so, but you, but you know that it's going to come and that that's um, not what he, what should be going on. So, you know, these yeah. myths, I mean, just myths are amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the so the theme of challenge B every every one of our challenge years has its own theme and they link together like a nice chain. So so challenge B the theme is ownership builds discipline. How is it that reading this book or these kinds of stories helps students to move from ownership of their education or their circumstances in life to discipline? So one of the examples I read was um, from the first book, from the first story in the book. Um, oh, it was the Minotaur. And um, this boy so badly wanted to meet his father, but his mother said he's the king and he's busy and a king has to serve his feet, has to serve everybody, not just you and me. And, uh, you know, so he wanted to be belong. He wanted ownership. He wanted to belong to his father, and she told him a, a task that he had to do. And if he could just work himself towards that task, then he could go meet his father. 
And he did. And so patience and, and perseverance and working hard were just automatically built into the story. Yeah, that's good, Lee. I think in the same story, Theseus is he's coming home, right? He's so excited because he's done these great things that he loses sight of something really important, right? He doesn't put up the right colored sails. <laughs> And so there's lack of discipline, mm. right? This lack of, lack of self-control and foresight and it ends up costing him dearly. Mm -hmm. Those are the, yeah, those are the two that I thought of in the Minotaur as well, that discipline and training to lift the rock and then the, the lack of discipline and forgetting something very important that his father told him to remember. Um, th this story also has... Um, several of them have this, but that idea of how to use your position well. And I mean, that's kind of the theme of choices a little bit also, but I do think there's an element of discipline in it as well and mm -hmm. figuring out how to um how to how to keep yourself from abusing your power and your position. Um and this this quote that I have underlined in in the Minotaur. Um, Theseus felt conscious that he was wiser and braver and stronger than his companions and that therefore he had the responsibility of all their lives upon him. And I just always think that's a really beautiful expression of what to do when you think that you are best equipped. It's not an excuse to lord it over people, but you need to have that self-discipline and use it to protect other people and shepherd them well. Um, and I love that this is the first story that Hawthorne did because it really does set the tone really well for those kinds of, this is what, this is what a good leader looks like. This is what good discipline looks like. This is the perils of poor discipline and forgetting things that are important. Um, and it sets the tone really well for the rest of them. And we can kind of trace those themes throughout the rest of the stories of being fastidious and honorable. Yeah. And that the first sign of a leader is that they're a servant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Thinking about that, that the that the discipline isn't always necessarily the self discipline of improving oneself, but can be a a restraining oneself either from doing wrong to someone or from exercising yourself so much that you leave others behind. Uh, it's a great lesson for the challenge B student who maybe is running ahead in their Latin studies or in their math studies and feel like they need to to show that off to everybody rather than serving the community by having a, a good and controlled conversation with, with others to help them flourish too. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's a big flaw in today's educational model that homeschoolers haven't been helpful towards is that, you know, all the academics should be just what I need and just what I like because it's my education and, uh, you know, I, I need to be equipped, forgetting that uh, we don't live by ourselves. We live in a community. And if we live in the body of Christ, we live in a demanding community. And that requires a different level of education and compromise and service than somebody who doesn't care what anybody thinks or doesn't feel like they have to serve others. So. That's, uh, that's a great segue to our, our little commercial break. Lee, do you want to introduce, introduce our sponsor and thank them? Yes, and I'll introduce our next guest, hopefully, too, if I remember. So I want to thank our sponsor, ClassicalConversationsBooks.com, where the books discussed can be purchased. We have the entire 2023 as well as 2024 Words Aptly Spoken calendar and archive at LeeBortons.com with links to that CC book site, as well as you can go to my YouTube channel at Lee Bortons in order to see the archived episodes. And I want to tell you about next week. We are very excited. We are very fortunate that one of us thought to do this before it was too late. We have invited Avi, the author of one of our books in the challenge curriculum, uh, Crispin. We talked about it previously in one of our other episodes. And the way I, reason I say fortunate is because he's in his 80s. And, you know, um, we're always accused of reading dead authors. And so now we have a live one that we can invite onto our show. And so we're, I'm just really excited about that. And for anybody that wants to know more about him before we uh, bring him on next week, he actually has a blog and it's called This Is Where I Came In. Let me say that better. This Is Where I Came In, Avi's Wordcraft. Uh, just quickly, he's written over 70 books and um, he says there's no such thing as writer's block. There's only not wanting to uh, work. So I think it'll be a good discussion with him. So I don't want to miss it. Thanks. All right, Tim. 
that that should be really exciting. I am excited to get to to hear from him um, as a as an author uh, looking up to a, a very successful author. That's always a nice thing to get to hear from someone who's really found great success in the field. Uh, all right, so in the second half of our program, we always turn our attention to the text itself and get to dig in a little bit and use some of our classical, classical skills and some of the things that we teach and practice in our programs. So in the challenge program, our students learn to write persuasive essays using the lost tools of writing curriculum. Um, and in a real brief nutshell, for those of you who are, are listening with us who don't know it yet, uh, it's um, a curriculum where students are tasked to find issues from the text. It's based on a decision that a character is faced with. Um, then the students are required to invent reasons for the character to make the choice on either side. So they have to in, in, invent both supporting and negating reasons for, for a person to make a choice in the book. Um, they then go through and sort those and figure out what's the best arguments for both sides before they make the choice of which side they're going to, to support in their writing. So in our close reading section today, we're going to we're going to practice some of those skills. We'll read um, a section from the Golden Fleece, the very last of the stories in the Tanglewood Tales. And then we're going to share I'll share my screen and we'll start to fill in a little bit of that chart, the affirmative and negative and interesting chart that helps us to keep track of our ideas as we think about it. So. Uh, Stephanie, it's a little bit of a long section. Are you up for reading a, a bit for us? You got your water there in case you need it. Yep. <laughs> Always got my water with my straw. So, okay. yes. <laughs> All right. From the Golden Fleece. So Jason dwelt in the cave with his four-footed Chiron from the big, from the time that he was an infant, only a few months old, till, until he had grown to the full height of a man. He became a very good harper, I suppose, and skillful in the use of weapons, and tolerably acquainted with herbs and other doctor stuff, and above all, an admirable horseman, for in teaching young people to ride, the good Chiron must have been without a rival among schoolmasters. At length, being now tall and athletic, Jason resolved to seek his fortune in the world without asking Chiron's advice or telling him anything about the matter. This was very unwise, to be sure, and I hope none of you, my little hearers, will ever follow Jason's example. But you are to understand he had heard he had heard how he himself was a prince royal and how his father, King Jason, had been deprived of the kingdom of Yolkos by a certain Peleus, who would also have killed Jason had he not been hidden in the centaur's cave. And being come to the strength of a man, Jason determined to set all this business to rights and to punish the wicked Peleus for wronging his dear father and to cast him down from the throne and seat himself there instead. With this intention, he took a spear in each hand and threw a leopard skin over his shoulders to keep off the rain and set forth on his travels with his long yellow ringlets waving in the wind. The part of his dress on which he most prided himself was a pair of sandals that had been his father's. They were handsomely embroidered and were tied upon his feet with strings of gold. But his whole attire was such as people did not very often see, and as he passed along, the women and children ran to the doors and windows, wondering whither this beautiful youth was journeying with his leopard skin and his golden tied sandals, and what heroic deeds does he, he meant to perform, with a spear in his right hand and another in his left. I know not how far Jason had traveled when he came to a turbulent river, which rushed right across his path with specks of white foam among its black eddies, hurrying tumultuously onward and roaring angrily as it went. Though not a very broad river in the dry seasons of the year, it was now swollen by heavy rains and by the melting of the snow on the sides of Mount Olympus, and it thundered so loudly and looked so wild and dangerous that Jason, bold as he was, thought it prudent to pause upon the brink. The bed of the stream seemed to be strewn with sharp and rugged rocks, some of which thrust themselves above the water. By and by, an uprooted tree with shattered branches came drifting along the current and got entangled among the rocks. Now and then, a drowned sheep, and once the carcass of a cow floated past. In short, the swollen river had already done a great deal of mischief. It was evidently too deep for Jason to wade and too boisterous for him to swim. He could see no bridge, and as for a boat, had there been any, the rocks would have broken it to pieces in an instant. See the poor lad, said a crackled voice close to his side. He must have had but a poor education since he does not know how to cross a little stream like this. Or is he afraid of wetting his fine golden stringed sandals? 
It is a pity his four-footed schoolmaster is not here to carry him safely across on his back. Jason looked around greatly surprised, for he did not know that anybody was near. But beside him stood an old woman with a ragged mantle over her head, leaning on a staff, the top of which was carved into the shape of a cuckoo. She looked very aged and wrinkled and infirm, and yet her eyes, which were as brown as those of an ox, were so extremely large and beautiful that when they were fixed on Jason's eyes, he could see nothing else but them. The old woman had a pomegranate in her hand, although the fruit was then quite out of season. Whither are you going, Jason? she now asked. She seemed to know his name, you will observe, and indeed those great brown eyes looked as if they had a knowledge of everything, whether past or to come. While Jason was gazing at her, a peacock strutted forward and took his stand at the old woman's side. I'm going to your coast, answered the young man, to bid the wicked King Peleus come down from my father's throne and let me reign in his stead. Ah, well then, said the old woman, still with the same crackled voice. If that is all your business, you need not be in a very great hurry. Just take me on your back, there's a good youth, and carry me across the river. I and my peacock have something to do on the other side as well as yourself. Good mother, replied Jason, your business can hardly be so important as the pulling down a king from his throne. Besides, as you may see for yourself, the river is very boisterous, and if I should chance to stumble, it would sweep both of us away more easily than it had carried off yonder uprooted tree. I would gladly help you if I could, but I doubt whether I'm strong enough to carry you across. Then, said she very scornfully, neither are you strong enough to pull King Peleus off his throne. And Jason, unless you will help an old woman in her need, you ought not to be a king. What are kings made for, save to succor and feeble, the, feeble and, the feeble and distressed? But do as you please, either take me across on your back, or with my poor old limbs I shall try my best to struggle across the stream. Saying this, the old woman poked with her staff the river, as if to find the safest place in its rocky bed where she might make the first step. But Jason, by this time, had grown ashamed of his reluctance to help her. He felt that he could never forgive himself if this poor, feeble creature should come to any harm in attempting to wrestle against the headlong current. The good Chiron, whether half horse or no, had taught him that the noblest use of his strength was to assist the weak, and also that he must treat every young woman as if he were his sister, and every old one like a mother. Remembering these maxims, the vigorous and beautiful young man knelt down and requested the good dame to mount upon his back. The passage seems to me not very safe, he remarked, but as your business is so urgent, I will carry you, I will try to carry you across. If the river sweeps you away, it shall take me too. That, no doubt, will be a great comfort to both of us, quoth the old woman, but never fear, we shall get safely across. <laughs> Speaking of those moments of adult humor, Lee, that you are referencing, there's a, one right there. <laughs> Makes yeah. me chuckle. Yeah. All right, I'm going to share my screen so we can start to fill in our Annie chart here. All right, so our issue for our little exercise today is whether Jason should have helped the woman across the stream. And you can answer with affirmative reasons or negative reasons, either one, or if there's just something that you found interesting that you're not sure what to do with, but it was an interesting fact all by itself, we can put it over the interesting column. So I found two things that are interesting that I can't figure out what to do with yet, but maybe I will. The one is the animals involved. So there's a centaur, which would have had really stable footing compared to a man on this river. And there's two birds related to this lady, one the peacock and one on her, um, the, was it a, a, a cuckoo? Is that what it was on her staff? Yep. Yeah, that's right. I didn't think about that, but they're mm -hmm. two birds. And I'm just wondering, and then of course the drowned animals going by. Mm -hmm. So that is interesting. And I'm trying to figure out if that's supposed to help me decide should or not. Good. Hmm. I think on the negative side, we have a rushing stream mm -hmm. that's, dangerous. that's evidently dangerous. On the affirmative <laughs> side, he needs to get across also, it sounds like. So whether it's right that moment carrying her or later, somehow he's going to try to get across. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. We have the, the negative of 
Jason sounds incredulous that her business is actually that important. Like she may not really need to get it may not she may not have that urgent of a purpose. Uh -huh. But then on the affirmative side, he has been taught to treat women with respect. So regardless of his suspicions, he should still want to help her. What do we do with the fact that she knows his name and his teacher? That's interesting, at, at <laughs> least. Like, it definitely belongs on the chart. Yeah, you could put it interesting. I think you could also put it in affirmative. That, uh -huh. Well, I don't know if it's affirmative about the should part, but it's affirmative in that there's more than meets the eye. Yeah, she, she seems wise. And so, especially in this culture you would think that would tip jason off that she's probably not asking him to do something impossible even though it seems impossible mm. um she seems to have some higher knowledge oh how about that end part where he says we'll probably both get washed downstream and she doesn't seem worried yes but the great comfort is to her is that he's gonna be as afraid as she is so he won't be dropping her mm -hmm. <laughs> what about the pomegranate yeah that was that was interesting right yeah okay because well we, i missed that we oh, well we she's holding a pomegranate i think uh-huh and in oh. the street right before um well there's a pomegranate <laughs> i don't want to give too many spoilers but the pomegranate is a deciding factor in somebody else's fate so waving this pomegranate around is probably meaningful mm. well also that it's out of season so yes. she knows things and has things that are unusual oh yes. and they're date and they're natural and the river is natural i wonder if that's a... so she might be trustworthy because nature seems drawn to her mm. or she could be untrustworthy because she has it when it's out of season mm. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's a good one to leave over sort of the interesting column because mm -hmm. we may need to play with that one for a while to figure out what it means or what it could, how it could influence this decision. Uh, let's see, I think that the animal carcasses live in the negative column, right? There's... Um, of it being super dangerous. <laughs> yeah. And and also the tree, right? The uprooted tree. Mm -hmm. That's clearly a sign that this is not just... Uh, a small stream or or pretty tame it's it's rushing and pretty deep to carry a tree along with it it's very true and it's the time of year this might just be an interesting because it's basically this first negative but it's the time of year where the river is really powerful it's been raining the snow has been melting this is not a good time to cross mm. yeah if he had asked chiron for his advice maybe chiron would have warned mm -hmm. him like this is not the time to set out <laughs> yes Okay, we also have the line, um, the noblest use of his strength is to assist the weak, which is similar to some of the other ones, but we'll throw it in there. Okay. Um, Let's see. Maybe he feels... if he her, she'll, she'll owe him something. That's never a bad thing to for somebody to have a favor that they need to give you. Mm -hmm. Wait, that's an affirmative, I think. Oh, you're right. Nice thing about Word documents, you can just move them around. Most of our students are going to be handwriting these. They have to cross it out <laughs> or erase it. Um, we are doing them on the board with the director. She can cross them. Yep. He So he felt ashamed, right? That's a... Yes. That's a motivation all by itself. Uh, then again, on the negative side, uh, she's pretty rough with him. Isn't she? Like, she kind of mocks him and rides him pretty hard to get him to do what she wants. Yeah. So, so in this case, you could say that, um, bring to what I was saying earlier, is that she's, uh, there may be some trickery afoot and that we don't really know this or know what she's up to, but we do actually, because, um, we're, it talks about her eyes and her eyes are beautiful and tr and large and uh, not the eyes of an old woman. 
I might be on both, right? Mm -hmm. I guess it could be negative. I mean, the the that they don't match her appearance. Mm -hmm. That like that always makes my little antenna go up when something is out of right out of the natural in some part. Well, it even says had a knowledge. Her eyes had a knowledge of everything, whether past or to come. Mm. You know, I think the best thing about this and any of our forms that we work on in CC is you don't always do exactly what the form says to do, but it makes you look a lot harder than you would without it. Yeah. So I. Uh a negative one it's, it's not a great strong argument but uh, again we want to we always encourage our students to include all kinds of arguments whether they're the best kind or not the best kind would be um he's proud of his sandals and and they might get lost mm -hmm. or or damaged why is he so attached to the sandals yeah it belonged to his father yeah they were his father's yeah Oh, that's right. Oh, I was so I was so mesmerized by this young man in a leopard skin. I missed the shoes oh, yeah. <laughs> and his long yellow ringlets. <laughs> I know. Right. I, I was going to say that for the interesting too. They kept talking about his long his long hair, which yeah. is a mythological thing that happens a lot. And also, interesting. I think that those last two in the affirmative need to be in the negative. I don't know. If... Oh, you're right. Thank you. I'm trying to write and. <laughs> talk at the same time never goes well um yeah that's i think one of those moments that probably hawthorne took a little bit of license in rewriting this right <laughs> the yellow long yellow ringlets it doesn't sound very greek does it <laughs> right. i was surprised by the blondness <laughs> i wonder why he did that <laughs> huh well i like writers of Hawthorne's time, blonde was usually like light and and good. Like a lot of the characters were good, so maybe that's why. The sharp rocks at the mm -hmm. bottom. Yeah, I was noticing. It, it uh, feels to me like something that's negative is the whole idea that it's near Mount Olympus, because if mm -hmm. other uh, Greek myths that have to do with Olympus. Usually there's some god trying to make mischief. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, and we do have like a footnote for this that we know probably who this lady is because of the peacock. So, and she is close to Mount Olympus. Well, ja so Jason's got a, um, a strong internal reason to cross this river, right? He, he has a, he's on a mission. So I don't know, you know, how much he'll be deterred from crossing the river on his own account, whether mm -hmm. he takes the woman with him or not. Yeah. So, Stephanie, finish your thought there about the peacock. Yes. So I had forgotten this, but there is the, the footnote that says um, it's probably the goddess Hera because she's associated oh. with peacocks. Um, and according to myth, jealous Hera changed, charged a 100 eyed monster named Argus to keep an eye on Zeus's lover. And then sadly, Zeus had Argus, the monster killed. And in Argus's honor, Hera decorated peacock feathers with hundreds of eyes. Mm -hmm. So, so she has the word. eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And all the stories I know of Hera, you do not trust her. Yeah, that's true. She is kind of jealous. And so we could maybe put that in the negative that if he if he does know who she is and if students know who she is, she's tricky. Yeah. On the other hand. <laughs> she's goddess. Right. Do you want to cross a god of any, a god or goddess of any kind? Right. <laughs> So, all right, well, if we were challenge A students, we would keep, or challenge B students, we'd keep filling out our Annie chart and and really plumb the depths of all of what we know about this. Today, we kind of looked at the text closely, which is good stuff. We would be, uh, as as challenge B students, we'd really be digging in with our five common topics and our, 
our invention tools, and then arranging this and trying to figure out which side we really think that Jason should take so we can try and persuade him to do what we think he should do. But today we're, we're going to leave it here. But before we go, what do you think? Based on what Jason knows as he stands there and what we read, should Jason help the woman across the stream or no? What would, what would you advise him? I'm going to say no, because he didn't ask Chiron anything. And he's worried about his pretty shoes. And this is a woman with trickery eyes. So I think he should wait. Mm -hmm. Stephanie? <laughs> I was leaning affirmative, because the, cross, the crossing at Goddess is dangerous. And <laughs> she's right that if they, well, if she's a goddess, I guess not. But if she both go, if they go under, they go under together. So she has no reason to not want him to get across and he does have to get across anyway. So he might as well assuage his conscience and do the right thing and bring her along and maybe have some goodwill. All right. Well, I think this is a great place to leave us. And then maybe our listeners can put their uh, their thoughts and votes into the comments in YouTube. So future listeners can see uh, which way our, our listeners would advise Jason and see who, which side would win. Thanks for doing this with us today. Oh, thank you so much, guys. That was fun. Thank see you, you next week when we talk to Avi. All right. <laughs>